Bruce flicked through the dusty old records of World War II pilots that died in 1945. He desperately hoped he wouldn't find what he was looking for. Bruce's heart began to pound as he found one name after another and another. The exact names of the pilots James told him about. He sat back astonished at the impossibility. Was his son a genius? This just didn't make sense. Suddenly, his stomach dropped. Boy wakes up with night terrors. Mom learns terrifying truth. Andrea and Bruce Leininger woke up to their two-year-old son James screaming during the night. He was having a nightmare. Plane on fire! Plane on fire! He screamed. It was the first nightmare he ever had, and one that seemed to be triggered by their visit to the World War II Museum earlier that day. His parents settled him back to sleep, completely oblivious that this was just the start of an unimaginable journey. At first, it was just a recurring nightmare, something that commonly occurs in young children. But then things started to get more serious and strange. James' terror grew each night and it haunted him during the day. It got so bad that his mom eventually became desperate to seek professional help. What was wrong with him? It was when Andrea started to ask James questions about his nightmares that she really began to worry something else was going on. When she'd ask him what was happening, he'd reply the plane is on fire and he can't get out. It was crashing over the ocean. But it was what he said next that kept her up at night. James told his mom that it was him on the plane, but when she tried to reassure him that it was just a dream, he replied with utter conviction that it wasn't. He told her that it really happened, and she could tell that he fully believed it. With each passing day, this belief only grew stronger, as did his description of the real-world events that surrounded this mysterious nightmare. Soon, nothing in their life would be the same again. Every day, new information unfolded. James told his parents that he was flying a Corsair plane in World War II and that the plane took off from a boat called an Atoma. When his father asked him how the plane was hit, he gave him a disgusted face and said with indignation, it was shot by the Japanese. Once Bruce realized everything he said checked out, he was astounded as he believed his two-year-old son to be a warfare genius. But that's not what Andrea thought. Andrea believed something else was going on entirely. After all, where was he even learning this information from? As far as she knew, he wasn't exposed to anything. Not to mention, James was adamant that he was this man on the plane. Once James started to share more details about the sight of his crash and fellow pilots, Andrea told her husband what she feared to be the terrifying truth. Andrea admitted that she thought their son was the result of reincarnation, but Bruce rejected this idea wholeheartedly and even got angry at the irrational suggestion. It wasn't until his son signed off a drawing on a plane as James III, i.e. James III, that Bruce decided to visit the library and piece together who exactly his son thought he was. That's when things got a lot stranger. Bruce spent days researching everything his son told him, from fellow pilot names to crash site details and lastly, his strange signature as James III, he slowly pieced the pieces together. As Bruce flicked through old accounts and records of World War II pilots that died in 1945, he desperately hoped he wouldn't find something that confirmed his son wasn't who he thought he was, because then what would that mean? Bruce's heart began to pound as he found one name, then another, and then another of the pilots James named as his friends. He sat back astonished at its impossibility, but he needed one last name for this all to make sense. He continued searching through the pages for a fighter pilot named James who died in 1945 over the Pacific. His plane caught on fire after being shot by the enemy. Suddenly, his stomach dropped. There, among the list of names of deceased personnel was that of James Hudson II. Bruce felt his hands weaken as the book fell to the floor. How is this possible? There was no explanation Bruce could think of. Everything he'd witnessed and heard from his son defied rational thinking. He felt completely out of his depth. But was reincarnation really what was happening? James believed himself to be James III, understanding that he was the continuation of James Hudson II. Still, Bruce needed more answers, so he searched for all of the people still living who knew James Hudson, including his last surviving relation, his sister Anne Hudson. Was it really plausible that this man was inhabiting his son's soul? My purpose for researching what was happening to my son was to establish that this was all a coincidence. But I was getting closer and closer to something dangerous. It was like putting my hand in a fire, Bruce recalled. It wasn't until Bruce contacted Ann Hudson that he finally began to accept what his son was telling him. Ann reflected that his memories were so much more personal than anything she had, but that's not all. She also confirmed that everything he said made sense. 
In the end, she had no hesitation about offering the Leininger family her belief in their son's story. Bruce felt defeated. He fought at every corner to deny the idea of reincarnation, but he could no longer fight with the evidence before him, especially after he received a call from another stranger. It was a veteran called John Richardson. He called to release a memory he told no one for 50 years. It was about Hudson's crash. He knew exactly how it happened because he was there, flying beside him and the last person to see him alive. He described the crash to the exact detail James did. Now, Bruce embraced the idea of reincarnation. But do you? What do you think?